Thanks, everybody, so much for coming tonight. This is a very important subject for all of us, obviously, and, and for the wider community. And I'm glad you came here to uh, hear our speakers who have come from California and locally here in Seattle to, to join us and help us understand the, uh, the issue of BDS. Um, I also want to thank uh, Reverend Rich Lang of the uh, of University Temple for giving us a home for the event and Dick Blakeney for helping me uh, uh, get in touch with the church and, um, and, and sponsoring the event. Um, I, um, I'm going to, the, the way in which I plan on doing, uh, organizing the event is that um, I'm going to uh, introduce all of our speakers and their bios and then they're going to come up and speak and then after all four of them have spoken, um, we're going to pass the hat and ask for donations to cover the cost of the event and bringing our speakers here. And then we'll take Q&A. Um, that's okay with everybody. And um, I also, I need to get one piece of paper. Um, I want to thank also the uh, organizations and groups that w are co-sponsoring the event tonight. Palestine Solidarity Committee, Seattle, Northwest BDS Coalition, Jewish Voice for Peace Tacoma, Jewish Voice for Peace Seattle, Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, Seattle Mideast Awareness Campaign, the B St. Mark's Bishops Committee for Israel-Palestine, and American Muslims of Puget Sound. Um, the, uh, I don't know if we worked out whether Nada is going to, Joel's going to go first. Okay. Let me, let me do Joel's bio first then. Um, Joel's a professor at Stanford. He's the Donald J. McLaughlin Professor of History and Professor of Middle East History. He received his uh, BA from Princeton in 1970 and his MA from Harvard in 1974 and his PhD from the University of Michigan. He studied at the American University of Cairo and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and he lived in Egypt for a number of years doing academic research and in Israel as well. He taught Middle East history at Stanford, and between 2006 and 2008, he was the director of Middle East studies and professor of history at the American University in Cairo. His research and writing focuses on workers, peasants, and minorities in the Middle East, the modern Middle East, and on Israel, Palestine, and the Arab-Israeli conflict. He's written a number of books and many, many articles, um, and I'm not going to read you all of them, but they're listed here. And um, Joel will speak first, and he's going to give a kind of historical overview of, uh, of the issues that sort of... Uh, impact um, what we're going to be talking about tonight. And then um, Professor Elia is going to be talking about BDS, and that is, she's an activist and a leader in the BDS campaign nationally and locally, and so she's going to talk in more detail about what BDS is, what it represents, its mission, its principles, etc. She is a diaspora Palestinian, born in Iraq and raised in Lebanon where she worked as a journalist during the Lebanese Civil War. She came to the U.S. for her postgraduate studies and since then has taught at Purdue University, Tufts, Brown, Washington State, and most recently where she is now at Antioch University. She's a founding member of, I'm going to just give the initials here and you can fill in what they stand for, USACBI, the U.S. Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, and she continues serving on its steering collective. She's a past president of the Association of Middle East Women's Studies and a founding member of the Radical Arab Women's Activist Network. She's a former representative to the United Nations of the Arab Women's Solidarity Association and a member of the Defense of Civil Rights in Academia. And she also is the author of several books, and her most recent one, I believe, is Trances, Dances, and Vociferations, Agency and Resistance in Africana, Africana Women's Narratives. And she's working on a new book, Who You Call in Demographic Threat, Notes from the Global Intifada. <laughs> so... Um, 
David, uh, David Palumbo Liu um, is going to be our final speaker. He's also teaching at Stanford, and he is the Louise Hewlett Nixon Professor at, S at Stanford and Professor of Comparative Literature and English, and serves as the director of the undergraduate program in Comparative Studies and Race and Ethnicity. Um, David wrote a, a, a remarkable, there was a really amazing uh, Los Angeles Review of Books uh, commissioned seven or so essays on BDS from academics uh, pro and con and in the middle. And David was one of those uh, seven people and it's really uh, interesting uh, set of perspectives on BDS um, and his being one of them. Um, if anybody reads my blog, I have a link in uh, one of my posts to the, to, the, um, to the group of essays. His fields of, uh, you know, he sent me a shorter bio and I'm reading the longer one. Um, his recent books are The Deliverance of Others, Reading Literature in a Global Age, and Emmanuel Wallerstein in the Problem of the World, System, Scale, Culture. He works on literary criticism and theory, race and ethnicity, social justice and human rights, and is part of the public intellectual project at Truthout and blogs for the Boston Review, Al Jazeera America, and Huffington Post. Um, so without fur further ado, I think that um, Joel can come up and, and be our first speaker. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming, and thank you, Richard, for uh, inviting me and organizing the event. I'm going to speak about history, because I'm a historian, and um, the main point that I want to make is that the choice of boycott, divestment, and sanctions as uh, a tactic in the Palestinian national liberation struggle is the result of a long history of trying to do different things that so far have not worked. Uh, and I'm going to go through that history very briefly. So very soon after the issuance of the Balfour Declaration in which the British government promised to foster the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine, Palestinian Christian and Muslim notables got together, convened the first Palestine Arab Congress, and um, said that uh, they did not accept this, uh, that they wanted Palestine to be part of an independent uh, Syria, which the British had promised uh, Arab leaders in order uh, to get them to revolt against the Ottoman Empire in the middle of World War I. And even though there were no Jews present at this meeting, uh, there were at the time about 25,000 Jews who had resided in Palestine for uh, some generations, in some cases before, and the Congress said very clearly that those Jews who have been uh, Arabized and who live among us, they are as we are, so this was a non-racialist, non-ethnically uh, specific call for all of the inhabitants of Palestine uh, to uh, democratically choose their future and on that basis to reject uh, the idea that uh, Palestine should become a Jewish national home. That's not um, the only sort of force that was around in this period. Uh, when it became clear that France was in fact going to make Syria and Lebanon uh, mandates, essentially colonies, um, Muslim forces in uh, and around Jerusalem uh, were particularly agitated about that. And there were uh, riots at the Nabi Musa uh, festival, an annual uh, festival that is uh, specific to, to Palestine. It's not a uh, broad Muslim festival, um, in which a number of Jews in Jerusalem were killed. Um, this was, at this point, rather exceptional. Um, and the earlier mode of uh, organizing uh, continued, even after the French uh, took over Syria. In the end of December uh, of 1920, the third Arab Congress uh, met in Haifa. The second one had been held in secret because the British made it illegal. At this point, since it was clear that Palestine couldn't be part of uh, greater Syria, um, the program of the group was uh, Palestinian local nationalism. This is really when we can say that the idea of a Palestinian national movement 
in the borders of British Mandate Palestine was launched. And uh, it still had at this point uh, a very elite orientation. You can see the pictures of the folks there, all very well dressed, many of them quite well educated, English speakers, uh, and so on. Um, they established an Arab executive headed by Musa Qasim al Husseini, which decided to send a delegation uh, to London to tell the British government what they thought of uh, what they were up to. And two delegations went during 1921 and put forward the political program that the Palestinian Arabs adopted and maintained throughout the rest of the mandate period until 1948. That the British should cancel the principle that they were committed to establishing a Jewish national home in Palestine. That a national government responsible to an elected parliament should be established. Basic democratic uh, liberal process that the British should in principle have supported that there be no mass Jewish immigration until a national government decided on immigration policy, that in the interim, uh, Palestine should be governed by Ottoman law, not by British military regulations, and there was still the residual hope that Palestine would not be separated from the neighboring Arab states, although that had become uh, increasingly unrealistic. There was, again, uh, an outbreak of largely uh, Muslim uh, inspired violence in 1929. Um, Right-wing Zionists went up to uh, the Temple Mount, the Haram al-Sharif, the noble sanctuary where the two uh, mosques are now located, but which before that had been the site of the first and second Jewish temples in the Jewish tradition. And they had waved the Zionist flag, which is today the flag of the State of Israel. Um, so intentionally uh, provoking the Muslim community, which uh, in August of 1929 uh, rioted against them. Uh, the violence was completely mistargeted because uh, of the 125 or so Jews who were killed and slightly larger number of Palestinian Arabs in the same period, almost all of them were ultra-Orthodox Jews who were in fact anti-Zionists. Uh, in Hebron and in Jerusalem uh, especially. Uh, this was the moment that al Haj Amin al-Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, made his entry and claim to be the national leader of the Palestinian Arab uh, national movement. And uh, this event uh, typified some of the problems of his leadership. Nonetheless, um, the Majority of the Palestinian notables continued to engage the British diplomatically. Uh, after the uh, Wailing Wall uprising, uh, or the Barak uprising, as it's called in the Arab tradition, um, the British sent uh, an investigating committee uh, that resulted in the issuance of the Passfield White Paper, a statement of British government policy in October of 1930. And uh, the White Paper was the first British proposal to limit, not clearly how and how much, uh, Jewish immigration into Palestine, uh, using the argument, which was largely correct, that it had stimulated this violent uh, Arab response. Very much as the Zionist lobby and similar groups do around the issue of BDS today, there was a big international campaign uh, and pressure on the British Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald to alter the policy proposals of the White Paper which his government had presented to the Parliament. And um, in response, MacDonald wrote what in the Palestinian tradition is called the Black Letter to Chaim Weizmann, then the head of the World Zionist Organization, in February of 1931, which effectively rescinded the White Paper. And in the photo here next to the cover of the white paper document itself. You can see uh, on your left, Mr. and Mrs. Chaim Weitzman sitting there socially with Mr. and Mrs. Ramsey MacDonald. And this captures actually the essence of the problem, that this social event could happen because these people saw themselves as uh, equals and in the same social sphere. And you did not have any similar picture of Palestinian Arab leaders sitting socially with uh, Ramsay MacDonald and his wife and other uh, British notables. 
So ultimately, frustrated by the complete incapacity of the British to respond to peaceful, democratic uh, petitions that, in principle, the British should have accepted because they were demands for majority rule, a democratic government, a government responsible to the citizens uh, who elected it, things that the British claimed they supported. But since they did not listen, and would not listen, ultimately sectors of the Palestinian people resorted to armed struggle. And the first uh, expression of armed struggle actually was organized not by a Palestinian, but by a Syrian, Izzedin al-Qassam, the military wing of Hamas is named after him today. Uh, he was uh, a preacher in the mosque of Haifa where uh, many Palestinian workers and peasants who became workers prayed. Uh, he organized them and their family and friends in the surrounding villages of Haifa into a secret organization. In November of 1935, they went into the hills around Jenin to begin an armed struggle, and very quickly, within uh, a week, the British captured them. Izzedin al-Qassam himself was uh, killed. Some of his followers uh, escaped. His funeral was the largest political event in Arab Palestine throughout the British Mandate period. Uh, a few months later, inspired by a general strike that the Syrians had uh, initiated to gain their political independence, um, a general strike broke out in Palestine. Uh, it was not called for or organized at first by the Palestinian notables, but once it began, the notables formed the Arab Higher Committee, which united all of the different families and factions of Arab Palestine. The strike lasted from April until September. Actually, that's a mistake there. It should be September 1936. Um, and it was called off by the notables because uh, many of them wanted to harvest their oranges, and they couldn't do that if the general strike would be still in effect. So, um, the <coughs> movement went into abeyance for a while, and then uh, in August, September of 1937, a peasant-led guerrilla war, very much in the classical 20th century model, uh, broke out. That was not led by the notables. Haj Amin al-Husseini uh, uh, had ex escaped from Palestine because the British uh, were seeking to arrest him. He was no longer on the scene, so this was much more a bottom-up uh, type of event. And the problem with armed struggle and the idealization of armed struggle is not, in my view, a moral one. I don't think, I don't have any problem with the fact that Palestinian peasants decided at this point that no other method had worked. The problem is that it gets easily out of hand. And the ultimate expression of it getting out of hand was the effective alliance between Haj Amin al-Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, and the Nazis during World War II. And this alliance destroyed the credibility of the Palestinian cause in the West. It was simply no longer possible after World War II for liberals and leftists in the West to think of the Palestinian cause as an issue of decolonization, um, which in fact it was, despite the fact that uh, this rather unfortunate alliance had taken place, which wasn't particularly supported by large numbers of Palestinians. Um, uh, Haj Amin al-Husseini never set foot in Palestine again after 1937. Um, but, but this shows what can happen all too easily in uh, an armed struggle. After World War II, a big wave of decolonization uh, took place. Most of the African and Asian colonies of Britain and France and other European powers achieved independence. One of the big exceptions was Algeria, and the reason was that Algeria was a settler colony, uh, and there were some 900,000 French settlers in Algeria, and they formed a very powerful political force in uh, the French parliament. Algeria was officially part of France, except that the 
vast majority of the population, the nine million Muslims, couldn't vote. And that meant that for some, the, some of the similar reasons as in Palestine in the 1930s, an armed struggle broke out, a very violent and vicious one. If you've seen the Battle of Algiers, it's quite accurate. And this is actually the uh, front page of one of the Algerian newspapers with um, the report of the three simultaneous bombings uh, in the fall of 1956, which were the emblem uh, of that uh, struggle against uh, French uh, settlers, um, and many innocent civilians were killed. Algeria did, however, win its independence. Uh, even though they never militarily defeated the French, the French ultimately, for political uh, reasons, decided they had had it, and they left. And that created a certain myth and a certain political base which the Palestinian movement uh, resurgent after the Nakba, the catastrophe of 1948, latched onto. So the first cadres of Fatah, which was at first not part of the Palestine Liberation Organization, because it thought that these are noble windbags who aren't actually doing anything to liberate Palestine. So the first cadres of Fatah were trained in Algeria, and there they absorbed that this is the kind of armed struggle that is both necessary and possible uh, and can lead to uh, a victory because see, the Algeria became independent um, and the Colons, even though they were not expelled, in fact, uh, almost all of them decided to leave and uh, go back to France. And that strategy was um, broadened and embraced beyond the Palestinians after the massive defeat of the Arab states in the 1967 Arab-Israeli war, and the victory of the Palestinian guerrilla forces in tandem uh, with support from the Jordanian army at the Battle of Karama, which, where they engaged an Israeli column and inflicted very heavy uh, losses on them it was uh, quite a shock for the, I for the Israelis. Karama, as it happens, means dignity. Uh, so this was a great slogan that we have finally, 20 years after the Nakba, learned how to fight back and make the Israelis pay uh, a military price for what they have done to us. Um, and it's easy to see how in the era of Vietnam and Algeria that, that this all made great sense. But just as the Arab revolt in the 1930s spun out of control towards the end, uh, this strategy also had its problems, and the emblematic moment of its problem was the massacre of Israeli athletes at the Munich Olympics in 1972. To massacre Israelis in Germany, you have to be a little bit tone deaf uh, if you're operating in a Western political environment. And so I put this quote by Frantz Fanon, who of course embraced and was the theorist of anti-colonial violence in Algeria, but at the same time understood that violence uh, has to be limited, um, that, that, there, that it can't achieve the ultimate goal of decolonization, which is equality uh, of the former colonizer and the colonized um, once uh, liberation and independence of the colony had been achieved. And eventually, the PLO also began to see uh, the problems of this kind of activity and began to turn to international diplomacy. And this is Yasser Arafat giving uh, his first of two speeches that he gave during his political career at the UN General Assembly in 1974, in which he said, I come to you with um, the rifle of a guerrilla fighter in one hand and an olive branch of peace in the other. Do not let the olive branch fall from my hand. He was ready for a negotiated solution, which would have meant, although the PLO was not yet clear about it, a two-state uh, solution. Uh, Israel was not in the slightest bit interested, uh, nor was the United States. Um, and the European Union was not yet on board with this, although it was uh, getting, uh, moving in that direction. 
The Camp David Agreement, which produced a peace treaty between Egypt and Israel, was also supposed to deal with the Palestinian question, and it didn't. Um, if you read Carter and Brezhnev's memoirs, they say that Israeli Prime Minister at the time, Menachem Begin, uh, tricked them, lied to them, and so on. Um, and the frustration that emerged out of uh, the United States not forcing Israel to abide by its commitments on the Palestine question at Camp David led again to some excessively uh, brutal uh, violence. Leon Klinghoffer, an elderly Jew, was uh, having a vacation with his family on the Achille Lauro cruise ship, a uh, very marginal uh, group uh, of uh, armed uh, faction in the Palestinian movement, uh, the Palestine Liberation Front, led by Abu Abbas, uh, uh, hijacked the ship. Abu Abbas, here you see him uh, murdering Klinghoffer. Uh, he himself was captured in Baghdad in 2003 after the Americans uh, invaded. So this kind of frustration, um, again, led to actions which uh, whether or not you can understand their motivation, were ultimately uh, politically uh, not effective. And so again, the PLO uh, reinforced its diplomatic orientation. That was made both necessary and possible because of the success of the first Palestinian uprising. It began in December of 1987. According to some people, it ended in 91, others 93. That's not so important. But what emerged here was, um, for the first time since 1948, Palestinians in historic Palestine had taken the lead. The Intifada was not organized by the PLO. Uh, and the leadership of the Intifada essentially demanded that the PLO come up with a political program that would uh, express and represent uh, the demands of the Intifada, and the Palestine National uh, Council uh, met, National and National Congress, excuse me, uh, the highest body in the PLO. They d adopted a declaration of independence, uh, which essentially recognized Israel and forswore uh, armed struggle, and were hoping that there would be an answer from Israel uh, to this, and there was none. Now, often, People look at the first intifada and praise its nonviolence, and it was largely nonviolent. But these pictures from the first intifada don't exactly match with what Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. would have embraced. Um, and I put them here um, to make the point that in the Palestinian political lexicon, nonviolence is rare, very rarely used. Uh, people more often talk about popular struggle. And the reason is that um, a certain amount of violence is almost inevitable in a colonial situation. No one here is using a gun, and Palestinians didn't use guns, ex with some rare exceptions during the first intifada. But we ought not to have illusions about what exactly was going on there. The peace process, which the United States initiated after the first intifada, um, was from day one uh, deceitful and doomed to failure. I won't go through all of it. Um, Rashid Khalidi's recent book, Brokers of Deceit, is an excellent account of it all, and I highly recommend it. Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir of Israel, um, who w was at the Madrid conference, who was prime minister during the negotiations between the uh, Palestinian representatives and Israeli representatives in Washington, 11 different meetings. One he uh, left office said, I would have conducted negotiations for autonomy for 10 years, and in the meantime, we would have reached half a million people in the West Bank. Um, well, it actually took a little bit more than 10 years for that number to be reached, but that is what there is now, about 560,000 uh, Israeli settlers in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. These negotiations eventually ended up in the famous uh, handshake on the South Lawn of the White House, the inauguration of the Oslo process, um, which according to the foreign minister, former foreign minister of Israel, Shlomo Ben Ami, had failure written into its genetic code. Why? Because this was from the start 
an unbalanced process in which the PLO recognized the existence of the state of Israel, not the right of the state of Israel to exist, and not that the state of Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people or any of these silly wordings that are now used to block negotiations effectively, but what states normally get, their recognition of their existence as a state. In exchange, what Israel uh, recognized was that the PLO would be the representative in negotiations of the Palestinian people. Not that the end of the process would result in a Palestinian state, not that the Palestinian people had the right to national self-determination. Um, so there were essentially no Palestinian rights written into the frame of reference of the Oslo process. And that is why more than uh, mistakes made in negotiations and so on, the second Camp David meeting in the summer of 2000 uh, eventually failed and led to the second Intifada, which on both sides was far more violent uh, than the first. Um, and again, the violence was counterproductive uh, for Palestinian uh, purposes. Um, it undoubtedly felt righteous and justified to engage in armed struggle after the failure of a protracted and very problematic diplomatic process. But ultimately, um, Israel has superior armed force and it was brutally used. Um, Israeli forces fired over a million bullets in the first 10 days of the Second Intifada before any suicide bombings uh, or any substantial Palestinian violence broke out. And really, it is the failure of the Second Intifada which led the group of uh, Palestinian civil society leaders in 2004 to embrace the strategy of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Uh, and this is not new, not unusual, not anything different than many other well-respected movements of national liberation uh, and uh, civil rights have done in the past. Martin Luther King, in the very first book he ever wrote, defending the justice of the Montgomery boy, uh, bus boycott, which was viciously attacked, uh, said, there is nothing quite so effective as the refusal to cooperate economically with the forces and institutions which perpetuate evil in our community. So Martin Luther King, apostle of, of nonviolence, um, ad adopted this tactic. It was first used in Ireland. It, the name boycott comes from a British land commissioner who was uh, oppressing uh, farmers in Ireland, uh, and they resolved to not cooperate with him. The United Farm Workers used the tactics with regard to grapes and lettuce. The South African uh, Ash uh, National Congress uh, used the tactic. Um, and so there isn't anything unusual or particular about the character of Israel or the character of this struggle. Palestinian leadership came to embrace this uh, as a way to pursue the struggle. Uh, because other things had not worked. And this is something that was internationally recognized. BDS appeals to universal norms of human rights and international law. It targets Israeli institutions, not Israelis as people. It is a democratic and inclusive strategy. Anybody can engage in it. Uh, internationals, Jews can participate. And uh, BDS, as a form of popular struggle, holds the moral high ground. And as we, uh, if you follow the news today, the Presbyterian Church uh, just a few hours ago voted to divest from three major corporations <laughs> who, whose profits uh, are uh, in, operate in Israel and Palestine and profit from the occupation. And this is an excellent example of what BDS as uh, a tactic can achieve. Uh, it's much more effective uh, in promoting Palestinian self-determination than the st structure of the peace process mediated by the United States, which had been very centered on Israel and from which Palestinian rights was all ex uh, essentially absent. So this is where we are today, a much better place than we were 
uh, not too many years ago, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Richard, for inviting me, and thank you, everyone, for being here. We had actually not planned this. We had not coordinated it. And then look at what I have titled mine. If not BDS, what? So uh, we're winning. I want to start out by saying that we are winning. We're winning big time. This is like a, a, today is a moment of celebration. Earlier this month, on June 6, the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation sold off all of its shares in GS for G4S, which is a company that supplies. Uh, yeah, yeah. G4S, for those of you who don't know it, supplies. Uh, security uh, management uh, equipment in six Israeli jails where uh, pa political prisoners are routinely tortured. And the Bill and Melinda Gates sold its uh, $170 million, which is all its shares in the G4S. Uh, that's June 6. June 10, the United Methodist Church also voted on a, the resolution to divest from G4S, and only today, as Joel said, the Presbyterian Church, after a week of deliberation, a week of decisions, and a very close vote, and they tried to dilute it, and they tried and tried and tried, and they were like, I mean, they were splitting hairs, just as about, which is really odd, because they were just about to like, no controversy, no problem, and there shouldn't be one, about to vote for uh, gay marriage in the church. That's okay. But BDS seemed to be the sticking point, you know? <laughs> so, so anyway, so we've, the, the clo it was a close vote, three, 310 in favor, 303 opposed, but the Presbyterians also voted. So we are winning, and we are winning thanks to BDS. Um, so, as Joel also said, BDS, we did not invent the wheel. We are borrowing it. We are borrowing it from giants who have used it and who, have used, uh, who are on our, our advisory board. And uh, of all the things that have threatened Israel, which is the country with uh, the fourth largest army in the world, certainly the largest and most brutal military in the region, Israel is not threatened by guerrilla warfare. There is no way, no way we could compete with Israel militarily, even if we actually have the legal right to engage in armed resistance. It would be stupid. It is counterproductive. It is, as Joel said, it's not, you know, it's not the right strategy. That's not what's going to liberate us. What is liberating us, what we are winning at, what is uh, BDS, and we are winning. So having said that, I do actually want to point, you know, Joel, you said a few things. That I, was, I, I was jotting down things. Like You said something like, um, in a colonial context, some degree of uh, violence is inevitable. I would say the colonial context is a, is a context of violence. When you showed pictures of the intifada and the violence, let's keep in mind the greater context of violence. The fact that Israel is an extremely brutal country addicted to violence, and that, you know, some degree of violence is inevitable. Colonialism is violent. Occupation is violent. There have been a number of strategies. None of them worked. BDS is working. BDS is winning. So, um, so that's why, if not BDS, what? And, uh, and I space bar on a Mac? Okay. So uh, Richard had asked me to give a, a general overview of BDS. And uh, so this is a, a very recent slide from, uh, you know, the campus divestment uh, of efforts at UCLA. In 2014, it's for Palestine. In 1986, on the same campus, uh, a call for divestment from South, Af South Africa. Desmond Tutu, this is a letter he wrote to the, uh, to the Methodist on June 10th, 2014, basically in support of the divestment resolution uh, that the Methodist voted on 10 days ago, exactly. He said, I know firsthand that Israel has created an apartheid reality within its borders and through its occupation. The parallels to my own beloved South Africa are painfully stark indeed. So uh, B why BDS of all the strategies? I mean, we. Uh, 
since 1948, and actually, as Joel said, since before 1948, since Israel, uh, since Great Britain decided that they were going to create within Palestine a Jewish homeland, and the Palestinians were like, "Wait a minute, what's going on?" Let's, let, you know, uh, they have been thinking of a lot of things and. Uh, and a lot of strategies, guerrilla warfare, uh, talks, uh, agreements, recognition, two states, uh, and none of these worked. And then as, they were, as we were looking, uh, Palestinian activists, organizers, thinkers, and all of that, were looking at what would work. And they decided that BDS would work because the reality on the ground in Israel, in Palestine today, between the river and the sea, which is basically the, the, the entirety of the land occupied by Israel, from the river to the sea, there is a situation of apartheid, of two completely different sets of rules that apply to people depending on their uh, religion, perceived ethnicity, and so if it is apartheid, what has historically been used as a strategy to abolish apartheid, and, uh, and um, they, we decided on on BDS. So the definition of apartheid, because a lot of people are really aggravated by the term apartheid. Israel is a democracy, not an apartheid state. Okay, the, the definition of apartheid, according to the UN General Assembly in 1973, is inhuman acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. That is the definition of apartheid. It's not you've got to be white over black. It's not exclusively South Africa. So one can actually speak of apartheid happening elsewhere in the world. That is the definition of apartheid. It is not exactly identical. The situation in Israel today is not exactly identical to what it was in South Africa. That doesn't mean that it's not a case of apartheid. I mean, when I always speak of genocide, there have not been two episodes, two incidents, two uh, phenomena of uh, genocide that are ab absolutely identical throughout history. And yet there has been more than one genocide throughout history. So what do, how do you define genocide? Does it have to have, for example, um, gas chambers? Then there was only one genocide throughout history. No. Okay, so that you can't use one unique manifestation of an incident to say that's got to define the incident. Does it have to have, for example, the genocide in Rwanda, uh, you know, mass uh, rape as a tool of uh, genocide? Well, not all genocides had that. So, so you can't just go, let's look at the differences. We need to have a definition. I don't have a slide of the definition of genocide, but you know, there are five criteria and if you fit, fit one of the five, then that qualifies as genocide. So I could also go into, you know, Israel is engaging in genocide, but Israel is engaging in apartheid. It does not have to be the same thing. If this is the definition, then the definition applies. I would question, for example, that the Jewish, the entirety of the Jewish community in the world is one racial group of people, but Israel, as far as Israel defines them, there is a racial group of people, the Jews. And so according to that definition, Israel is engaging in apartheid because it is engaging in inhuman acts, home demolitions, uh, torture, massacres, you name it, Israel is engaging in it. Inhuman acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination by one racial group of persons over any other racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. We have laws. It is within the legal system that there's about 50 laws that discriminate against non-Jews in the entirety of the country that Israel is occupying from the river to the sea because it is totally in control of every aspect of life in the West Bank and Gaza, even though people say, well, it withdrew from Gaza. Yeah, right. How, who's controlling everything in Gaza? So let's, you know, we, I don't need to get into that, but there is a system of apartheid. So within that system, we looked at models, we looked at strategies around the world, what can work. We have a system of apartheid, we have a settler colonial state, we have a brutal occupier, boycott, divestment, and sanctions is the nonviolent strategy of global solidarity, 
It relies on global solidarity. It's not something that the Palestinians can engage in by themselves, just like the South Africans were not the ones boycotting South Africa. It's a nonviolent strategy of global solidarity which put an end to apartheid in South Africa and which allows people of conscience today to play an effective role in ending Israeli apartheid. So that is what BDS is. BDS boycott, a form of pressure through non-cooperation. I think if you, uh, you know, the, the, the quote that Joel showed about Martin Luther King and how he said there is nothing as effective as non-cooperation in economic or whatever, that's basically what boycott is, a form of pressure through non-cooperation financially. So when you boycott, you are not, you know, you're speaking with your dollars basically, and you're not buying something. Divestment is not that you're not buying something, it's that you are not investing in it. So the selling of stocks or bonds from a company profiting from unjust practices, uh, Caterpillar, Motorola, Hewlett Packard, the, you know, G4S, these are all profiting from, you know, Caterpillar, for example, the most uh, obvious example that at least all of us here in the Seattle area should be aware of, Caterpillar builds the D9 bulldozer, which is retrofitted with the blade to demolish Palestinian homes. Um, that's one example. Uh, Hewlett Packer creates uh, the surveillance thing on the, uh, on the apartheid wall, and uh, Motorola also the communication. <coughs> anyway, so boycott, form of pressure, divestment, sanctions are economic and diplomatic restrictions imposed by governments against other governments. We're not there yet. But, uh, you know, I think that comes less. And it's really important also, as we say, we're not there yet, when we think of the uh, parallel with South Africa. Because we've been at BDS basically, <coughs> excuse me, it's almost 10 years old now. And with 10 years, we have done, I mean, we are basically at this point, we are in the mainstream consciousness. Uh, despite the the blackout, the censorship, the fight, and in fact, the more we're winning, the harsher the, the censorship, the silencing, the propaganda, and all of that, it's because we are winning. You know, as Gandhi said, at first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. They're fighting us. <laughs> they are fighting us. They're fighting us really, really, really hard. In fact, this program is in response to basically an attack on BDS, that it is a threat to the Jewish community in Seattle and worldwide, right? BDS is anti-Semitic, uh, as I, you know, like, how is it anti-Semitic? Is Caterpillar a Jew? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, so. So the boycott, divestment, and sanctions calls was issued in 2005. Interestingly, the call for an academic and cultural boycott of Israel was issued in 2004 before the general call for BDS, which was issued in 2005. And it was a call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Nonviolent measures should be maintained until Israel comply by, with international law by basically three things. And I have my uh, cards that I was going to hand out, and I will hand them out at some point. Ending the occupation and uh, and dismantling the wall, recognizing the fundamental rights of Palestinian of Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel to full equality and respecting, protecting, and promoting the Palestinian right of return. So BDS should be in place. Boycott, divestment, and sanctions should be in place until Israel comply with international law by fulfilling these three things. All we are asking of Israel is that it actually act like the democracy that it wants to be. Israel is always saying, Thank you. Israel is always saying it is the only democracy in the region. Well, yeah, sure, we want democracy. And democracy means you end an illegal occupation. The occupation is illegal. Despite the Zionists who say, no, it was land acquired by war, it is actually illegal to acquire land by war. So even if the Arabs started it, which is another disputed thing, but even if the Arabs started it in 67, and Israel defeated the Arabs in 67 and acquired war. It is illegal to acquire war, uh, land by war. Otherwise, everyone would be starting wars and trying to acquire land by war. You know, I mean, there's a reason why it's illegal. So the occupation is illegal, whatever the Zionists say. The wall has been declared illegal in two, uh, has been found declare, uh, illegal in 2002 by the International Court of Justice. The fundamental right of Arab Palestinian citizens of, of Israel to full equality, hey, Democracy, yeah, right. 
respecting, protecting, and promoting the Palestinian right of return, it is a right. It is a universe. It's enshrined in the human the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and it has been resolved uh, in the United Nations. That's 194. In 1948, the Palestinians have a right to return. And so we are asking of Israel to basically respect international law and be a democracy. Wow. I mean, some people say that we're trying to destroy Israel. I would just... Earlier, I was having a conversation, like, BDS wants to destroy Israel. No, BDS wants to fix Israel. I mean, you know, it's not out of love for Israel, but if BDS achieves its goals, Israel, BDS would have fixed Israel. Just like the South Africans fighting against apartheid were not doing it out of love for South Africa, but eventually South Africa became a better country, just like the U.S. South became a better part of the world after the end of segregation and Jim Crow and all of that. We're fixing things. We're not destroying things. All right. Why academic and cultural boycott? Because BDS, okay, everybody, well, I'm hoping that everyone understands that, you know, uh, you don't buy products from the settlements. The settlements are illegal and Ahava, you know, it's made in stolen, res uh, so everybody understands, even though they don't necessarily agree, the boycott of, you know, shell items that you see on the shelves in grocery stores. And some people are actually a lot, a lot more um, not so sure about academic and cultural boycott. Why academic and cultural boycott? Because they are being used for propaganda. Because they are an official propaganda program by the Israeli government, by the three main ministries in uh, Israel, the foreign ministry, the prime minister's office, and the finance ministry. Those are the three largest ministries in Israel, and they have come together and they have decided our image is being tarnished in the world. We have to fix our image. How do we fix our image? We fix it through academic and cultural propaganda. Hence, the academic and cultural boycott is a no. Don't whitewash the uh, occupation and whatever. So it was, uh, oh, there they are. I didn't have to remember them. They're on the board. <laughs> Brand Israel is an official Israeli government which seeks to divert worldwide focus away from Israel's occupation and apartheid policies and towards its scientific and cultural institutions, fixing the image, not the policies that tarnish the image. So culture and academic and scientific accomplishments become a vehicle for propaganda. Israel is so, I mean, you know, proud. Uh, it, it does have amazing accomplishments but it is using them to, to, as a smoke and mirrors to distract from the reality. Oh, look, we've invented the grape tomatoes, so it's okay if we massacre people. No, you know, it's not okay. You can be, inve I'm, I'm, you know what? Germany under the Nazis also produced fabulous music. Was it not also burning people in concentration camps? Culture should not be used as propaganda. So Brand Israel, Ari Mikhail, who is the Israeli consul, who was, he no longer is, Israeli consul general to New York, did say, we will send well-known novelists and writers overseas, theater companies, exhibits. This way you show Israel's prettier face, so we are not thought of purely in the context of war. They're sending these wonderful people and speakers for, as part of the propaganda. Wayne Firestone, Hillel uh, CEO, there's a need to portray Israel as a place with cool hip people because now people are thinking Israel is actually a brutal occupier engaging in massacres, so let's portray it as nice. So, so we get someone like Idan Meshel, who is a cultural ambassador. He is like, uh, he sings with uh, Ethiopian Jews, and he sings of multiculturalism and wonderful diversity in Israel and all of that. He's just like hip, cool, and whatever. But he also defends torture in Israeli jails, pro -settlement, his pro-settlements. He believes Israeli artists have a duty to play an active role in public relations for the Jewish states. That's from his uh, website. And he asserted that Israeli conscientious objectors are at the very bottom of Israeli society. That's not what's known about him. When he tours, he tours as this amazingly cool, hip, uh, multicultural art Israeli artist who sings with Ethiopian Jews, who is like all into whatever. But that's, so he's a wonderful cultural ambassador. Cultural ambassadors, again, what is Israel doing to fix its image? So they ran a 
like six or 12 pages in Maxims, which is all Israeli soldiers who are models. <laughs> I mean, everybody is a soldier in Israel, so of course the models would also have served. Uh, so David Saraga, Media and Public Affairs Consul at Israel's consulate in New York, said these models are Trojan horses. Many Americans don't even know we have beaches. So let's, let's you know, I mean, attracting people to the beaches. Uh, so that's, again, cultural propaganda. Uh, certainly pink washing. <laughs> it's hidden. <laughs> OK, so. Uh, Michael Lucas is a gay po What? You're all adults in here. <laughs> Most of you are y older than me. <laughs> he said, nobody comes to Israel for Golda Meir. Men of Israel, which is a gay male porn movie. And the calendar was made 12 pages, and each page shows one of them. This actually is him. This is Michael Lucas, because he started out as an actor, and he became a film director. Uh, Men of Israel is free PR for Israel, and it's much better than the PR they're getting on the news. So again, Israel as a gay-friendly country, which is something we hear over and over and over again. It's a gay-friendly country. But it is a gay-friendly country for Jews. It's not a gay-friendly Jew country for non-Jews. So again, I mean, keep thinking of the context of what propaganda is used for and the hidden reality. You know, that for example, Idan Risha, I don't know how to pronounce his name, right. sings about uh, uh, multiculturalism, but he sings in settlements, so you know, nobody, it's not everyone who can show up at his concerts. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's, uh, yes, Israel is a gay-friendly country for Jews. It is not friendly for Palestinians, gay or not. You know, it doesn't ask someone before demolishing their homes, are you queer? Because if you're queer, we're gonna save your house. <laughs> so buying Israeli goods is funding apartheid, and performing in Israel is supporting apartheid too. So just as we're boycotting these, we also, the academic and cultural boycott is don't go and perform in Israel. And there's a lot of that as part of the uh, boycott. So there's a lot of artists who have, uh, who have embraced the boycott. Roger Waters, he's one of the big names. He's spraying no thought control on the apartheid wall. He is totally a spokesperson for the academic boycott. Elvis Costello made a fabulous statement when he was invited to speak, uh, to perform in Israel. He said, one lives in hope that music is more than mere noise, filling up idle time, whether intending to elate or lament. Sometimes a silence in music is better than adding to the static and so an end to it. And he refused to perform. So he, fa he said, my silence in, in, as a per singer is better than anything I could sing. I can't go and sing about peace. What I can do is not go. And he did not go. Artists who have refused to per perform in Israel, Elvis Costello, Raj, all of these. OK, I'm trying to really respect my time, and I have gone over. So um, Roger Waters, the Pixies, Carlos Santana, Gil Scott Heron, Ken Lo Yes, they're so amazing. And hundreds more, hundreds. So if you want to see where, go to PACB. PACB is the Palestinian Campaign for Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. And the academic boycott, which I believe you're going to be speaking about academic boycott, so I'm going to go over it really fast. Uh, Israeli research centers and universities are complicit in violations of international law and the human rights of the Palestinians. And the boycott is of institutions, not individuals. It's really, really important. I'm an academic. We're all, ac you know, the three of us speakers are academics in here. And I think that we all three very much cherish academic freedom, and an academic boycott is not about ending academic freedom. It is actually, again, about securing academic freedom for those who do not have it, because freedom is merely privilege extended unless enjoyed by one and all, and the Palestinians do not have academic freedom. Not only do the Palestinians not have academic freedom, but the Israeli universities are very, very, very complicit in the violation of the human rights of the Palestinians. And I could go on and speak about how the, the apartheid wall is actually um, 
drafted, engineered, created, blueprinted, whatever those words are, in an Israeli engineering department, university engineering department. The settlements are, uh, again, drafted, painted, what, drawn, whatever that's called, in architecture departments in the universities. Uh, the, uh, the, the blade the, that is retrofitted on the D9 bulldozer because Caterpillar actually makes the D9, but the blade is retrofitted and it is retrofitted and designed in a university in uh, Israel. So the universities are the ones who are actually, you know, just the history and sociology books that don't speak about our Nakba, that's part of violation too. So the Israeli universities are very, very complicit. Uh, I could talk about it some more, but, but that's it. I'm really running out of time, which is what, so if not BDS, what? And, and so I, I, these are some websites that are interesting, that, that may be useful. The Northwest BDS is a group of, it's a coalition of uh, groups in Seattle that meet uh, on a quarterly basis to discuss uh, BDS related actions and I'm happy to circulate a sheet. The Palestine Information Project is also Seattle based and does a lot of actions. Nationally, there's US ACB, where's my little Ziploc of cards, I will pass that, and the US Campaign to End the Occupation. And internationally, there's the BDS movement and PACB, which is the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel. Thank you very much. <laughs> BDS, uh, when it started in 2005 and, and up until recently, has been very controversial, and it still is in some circles. But um, in the past year, it's developed a gravitas and a sort of forward momentum um, that's uh, indisputable. And I'm going to talk about a few of those things, uh, which Nada as well uh, talked about. I'm going to try to talk about a few other things uh, that she didn't mention. Um, and it's become a fast-growing grassroots opponent of the Israeli occupation. It, um, uh, Nada mentioned uh, companies that are being uh, pressured uh, uh, for their activities uh, in the West Bank and the occupation, and mentioned Motorola, which makes surveillance systems for settlements. Caterpillar, as we heard, made the bulldozer that actually killed Rachel Corey, um, and operated by a, an IDF soldier, obviously. And uh, Eula Packard makes biometric ID systems for security checkpoints. And that's the reasons why uh, we want to target companies like that. Um, she mentioned also the G4S um, divestiture. And one thing that uh, she didn't mention was that in, as a result of the Gates Foundation action, G4S itself announced that when the end of their contract with the Israeli prison system and the Israeli occupation uh, came to a conclusion, that it was no longer going to have any uh, commercial interactions with Israel. Um, that's a direct... Uh, uh, that's a direct reaction to the Gates Foundation and another um, a small victory. Um, we've talked about the Presbyterian Synod uh, and their vote, their amazing vote. Um, you may recall that in 2012, the same group took a vote on, on uh, BDS and the, had the opposite result. So we are continuing to make progress. And it's again all because of this momentum. It's the momentum both of BDS um, um, becoming more of a household name, and it's also, unfortunately, uh, for Israel, the result of its continuing policies uh, uh, that become more and more extreme, more and more violent and aggressive, and lose more and more support uh, in the world. I wanted to talk about what led up to this uh, Presbyterian vote, and that was uh, yesterday, I think, there was an address to the Presbyterians by the leader of the reform movement in the United States, the largest Jewish denomination. His name is Rabbi Rick Jacobs. He gave an address which basically was um, begging them to do anything other than vote for BDS. And um, the, uh, the speech was covered in the Jewish Forward, and this is what he said, or in part. Quote, a vote for divestment will cause a painful rift with the great majority of the Jewish community. And you'll notice that he's trying to speak on behalf of the entire Jewish community, whether he has the right to or not, and say, 
how many of, uh, of the Jews will be in favor of this supposed rift that he's talking about, which is questionable, I think. Um, he continues, if we are truly partners and you disapprove the divestment overture, I look forward to sitting with your leadership in the prime minister's office in Jerusalem. He followed that up by saying, don't miss this, you can choose partnership and engagement or you can choose separation and divestment. In other words, he is saying that if you endorse BDS, you endorse the boycott, we Jews will, in, we will boycott you. Which doesn't seem quite logical to me, but um, okay. Um, he said um, that he shared the Presbyterians' concern about the, the um, about Israeli settlement policy. Notice he doesn't say anything about the occupation. He doesn't say anything about a Palestinian state. He only restricts himself to talking about settlements and says that, yes, the reform movement or American Jews agree with you about the, uh, uh, the settlements. We are against settlements, he said. We are for the two-state solution, but we can't fight alone. We need each other. And if you choose partnership over divestment and BDS, together we can change the world. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sort of think, thinking like we are the world is going to start, you know, <laughs> blasting from the speakers there any second. Um, he's essentially telling one of American Protestantism's major denominations, if you don't reject the bo boycott, then American Jewry will boycott you. And why does um, uh, Rick Jacobs think a meeting with Bibi Netanyahu would induce them to reject BDS? <laughs> Why does he believe that Israel's prime minister would be a persuasive voice in the debate? On the contrary, Netanyahu, who does have a reputation, believe it or not, in Israel of being a very persuasive orator, has the opposite reputation out, outside of Israel. And for some reason, the leaders of the American Jewish community do not get it. They don't understand the, the, the difference of the way he's perceived in Israel and the ways. I mean, I would think that offering the Presbyterians Bibi Netanyahu is the last thing that you would want to do if you wanted them to vote against uh, BDS. Um, so Jacob's assumption uh, 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 and what he offered the Presbyterians in, the, in that passage exposes the weakness of the reform uh, Judaism's commitment to real change in Israel and Palestine. When he talks about the common agenda of Jews and Christians after, after they reject BDS, it amounts to one thing, opposing settlements. But settlements are only one part of a much bigger issue. He omits Israeli democracy, which Nato talked about. He omits the right of return. Most glaringly of all, he omits a Palestinian state. Even if you don't want a one-state solution, why don't you talk about a Palestinian state? That's not there. So on what basis will Christians find common cause with such a, uh, a truncated agenda? Um, Israel, the Israeli beverage maker SodaStream, you all know about what happened during the Super Bowl. We had Scarlett Johansson uh, um, uh, pumping uh, SodaStream soda um, on TV, and um, it, caused, it raised a furor because BDS went to Oxfam for whom she was a, an international spokesperson and said, Oxfam, under your own rules, doesn't permit uh, people that are associated, affiliated with it officially to be involved in supporting settlements and supporting the occupation. So Oxfam agreed to give her a choice. What is your choice, Scarlett Johansson? Do you choose us? Do you choose opposing the occupation? Do you choose human rights? Or do you choose being the global ambassador, that's what her title was, for SodaStream and the, all the money that comes with it. She, her response obviously was, I'll, I'll take the money. Um, and she dissociated herself, or Oxfam dissociated itself from her. But the, the amount of publicity that BDS got from that, you couldn't have bought with 100 uh, Super Bowl ads. So um, the movement, and, and Nada has talked about this, uh, talked about the cultural boycott, and the academic boycott, and we should mention also Stephen Hawking was another academic who refused to go to Israel and speak at an academic conference, an important figure, um, um, and, and one of the best known figures who, who's done that. And it enables, I think, other academics who might be afraid of taking that step, seeing someone like of his stature doing it, enables them to follow suit. And so that's what BDS is, it's a, it's a gradual evolution of a movement that starts out being 
diff controversial um, and, and being ostracized and gradually becomes more and more accepted over time. Um, the more eff effective that BDS has become, the more its opponents have tarred it with the terms, again, that Nadia mentioned, um, anti-Semitic, anti-Israel. The latest example, um, again, Nadia alluded to that, and I want to go into it a little more, is the Seattle Jewish Federation. And virtually every Jewish communal organization and every synagogue in Seattle united behind a program that they uh, put on not last so, month. Not so. <laughs> what? You're overstating. Well, it left out. Uh, it left out. Maybe left out Jewish Voice for Peace. Left out Kadima. No, most of Jewish congregations were not sponsors. Okay. Well, anyway, mine Be congregation Beth Shalom was a sponsor. There were many others that were sponsored. De Hirsch Sinai, where it was, it was. I'm I'm glad that there weren't. Uh, if there were, mine was not. if you, which one was yours? Oh, okay. Great, great. So those people are to be commended for not. Um, getting on that bad wagon. So, um, but unfortunately, the lion's share of the community, in almost in unison, except for Colin Shema and some others, um, got on this bandwagon. And the title, is, which is important to hear uh, for this uh, event, was The BDS Campaign Against Israel, Bad for Jews in Seattle and Beyond. When I read that, my blood started to boil. And that's when I started thinking about how to do something that would present a different perspective on the issue. Um, and that's what led to this uh, event eventually. So that event last month featured Ari Shavit, who's a journalist for Haaretz, one of Israel's leading uh, only liberal uh, daily newspaper. Um, he is on the right wing of the uh, columnists that write for Haaretz and um, very smart and very uh, facile. Uh, very articulate, but um, his arguments and his intellect, I think personally, are extremely weak. And he just came out with a book, um, which I can't remember the title of, but it, it what is it called? My Promised, Land. My Promised Land. Reviewed everywhere, the New York Times gave it a glowing review, David Remnick in the New Yorker, everybody, Charlie Rose had him on. You know, he was the liberal sort of, uh, uh, Daily, he was the, uh, the, the, the like the soup du jour, you know, uh, uh, for American media in terms of uh, presenting a liberal, quote unquote, liberal perspective on on Israel. Um, his talk, his pitch at this event was incredibly pernicious. Um, he uh, argued that um, BDS's goal was not to end the occupation, but to end Israel. And we talked about that. Um, he argues, and many people opposing BDS argue, that the full return of the refugees under the right of return would flood Israel with millions of refugees, millions of Palestinians, millions of people alien to Israeli society, alien culture, and would overrun Israel and would end the uh, project of, of Israel as a Jewish state and would turn Israel into, you know, I, I haven't even conceived of what they're you know, imagine um, they talk about destroying Israel or eliminating Israel as if BDS is going to, you know, take an army and march into Tel Aviv and um, and take over, which obviously as a nonviolent movement, it's not going to do that. But it is going, if it succeeds, it is going to change Israel. Um, so for Ari Shavit and, and others like him, it's a hop, skip and a jump from something that is going to quote unquote destroy Israel to something that is anti-Semitic. Because if Israel is a, an expression of the Jewish people, represents the Jewish people, then if you destroy Israel, you're in effect engaging in an act of aggression against the Jewish people. That's sort of like the thinking uh, of it. Um, so um, locally, um, Jewish student, uh, locally students at the University of Washington just uh, I think the name of the group is Super, and they put forth a divestment, uh, a BDS resolution before the student union. And um, um, I read a really interesting, uh, thoughtful piece by the Hillel Rabbi on campus in the Jewish newspaper, in which he said, we made a big mistake in opposing BDS. We let the crazy ideologues, extremists in our community take over this campaign. And so we let Stand With Us take over. 
We let them run this campaign. We let them turn it into a mudslinging contest and, um, you know, with blaring trumpets and, and slogans and whatever. And that was detrimental to, he says it was detrimental to our goal, not only in, 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 in opposing BDS, but detrimental to our goal in achieving um, some kind of ability to talk to those who w oppose us. Um, and I agree completely. I mean, Stand With Us is, one, is kind of one of my, um, you know, bet noir um, in, in the blog that I write about uh, as often as I can. <laughs> um, so, um, um, the vote at UW lost, but it's the first step, as we've been talking about. BDS is not going to win as, you, as it already hasn't win, won in a year. It's maybe not gonna win in a decade. It's gonna take time for these things to evolve. There's probably gonna be a second vote at the UW at some point in the future. And that second vote, just like the vote at the Presbyterian Synod, the second vote will probably be different. Um, down in California, where David and Joel uh, are teaching, the UC campuses, five of the nine campuses have voted to support the BDS. Um, and 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 uh, promote divestment. Um, so there's and we talked about UCLA being one of them. Um, so that's going to you know this is what happened with South Africa. It started out also as a controversial subject of sanctions, and there were lots of arguments by the equivalent of the neocons talking about how we're going to hurt South Africans if we if we uh, hurt their economy. It's going to hurt the poorest of the South Africans. We hear that again with BDS. It's only going to hurt the poor workers at the Soda Stream factories who are all Palestinians and earn you know they earn a good wage at the Soda Stream factory. And why would you want to take that employment away? from them. And that, of course, loses sight of the fact that we are not, this is not a movement that is trying to take jobs away from people. It is a movement that is, that is set its sights on the greater, broader issue of how do we create a just solution to this conflict that is going to be just for both Israelis and Palestinians. Um, I want to talk also about how BDS is controversial because of all of this stirring up of, of hostility and controversy by groups like Stand With Us, it's made the issue anathema even in the media, in the local media. Um, I attempted to get some media coverage for this event and I largely struck out. I tried with a local public radio station and I tried with the Seattle Times. The uh, public radio station um, was willing to have former Israeli ambassador Michael Oren speak on air with the condition put forward by the Israeli consul that he would not speak with any other guest on air and he wouldn't take any call in questions. This is a program in the morning that all of you listen to. I won't say the name of the station, but uh, because I'm hoping that they might uh, um, broadcast the, the audio of this uh, possibly. But um, they were willing to agree to those conditions. So Michael Oren didn't have to face any controversy. And afterwards, when I asked the general manager, he said, well, our interviewer was the one who was going to ask the, him the tough questions. But that's not the issue. The issue is that your format is that you, your, your whole show is based on the premise of having more than one guest usually and having call-ins from the community so you can hear different perspectives and you can hear a wide range of views. So you close off uh, 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 debate, you close off discussion about Israel when you do something like that. And also this radio station would not uh, interview David or Joel on air. Um, and I, you know, I never heard why, just they wouldn't. The Seattle Times is a little different. I pitched them an op-ed on this and I wrote the op-ed when they said to me that I could write the op-ed. And the response was, the Seattle Times does not publish op-eds that call for boycotts. <laughs> so, I, you know, I scratched my head and I said, what? Is this, what are you talking about? I know that, you know, Frank Blethen is a, is an, a devout libertarian. Maybe I'm thinking like he's opposed because he's a businessman, he's a, you know, runs a big uh, conglomerate. He's opposed to boycotts out of a business philosophy or something like that. I, I didn't know. But, but, you know, I argued, I said, the issue is not that, that BDS wants to bankrupt Israeli companies or, or American companies. It wants to change a political consciousness. And one of the ways of doing it is going to be by trying to hurt 
the, the bottom line of some of these companies and persuade them otherwise. There is a Supreme Court, U.S. Supreme Court decision from the 1960s, NAACP against a Mississippi hardware store. The NAACP was boycotting the hardware store. I don't know whether it was because they didn't hire a black, a blacks or whatever it was. And the NAACP, we think of as a uh, nonviolent organization, but they told their members that if you shop at this hardware store, we're gonna, we're gonna beat your head in. <laughs> and so the US Supreme Court said that kind of boycott was acceptable because the boycott was for a moral purpose, a political purpose. And they were, there was not actual violence. There were threats of violence. Now, BDS is not threatening anyone. They're not threatening to knock anybody over the head if they you know, don't do something. Um, so the, the idea of somebody saying we can't run an op-ed because it advocates a boycott you know, was inconceivable to me. So I wrote that and I got a response back and said, mm, you're, kinda, you're right, I think that boycott, that wouldn't be a good reason not to run your, your op-ed, but we're still not gonna run it. <laughs> we're just not gonna give you a reason this time. <laughs> they they were, weren't smart in giving me a reason the first time because then I could argue against it. Um, little of what opponents of BDS say is true about BDS. The problem lies with your definition of Israel. Does being a Jewish state mean that Jewish citizens should be guaranteed superior rights to non-Jewish citizens? Or does it merely mean that Israel must be a state in which Jews are secure and may realize their dreams of self-determination alongside those other ethnic or religious groups inside Israel who want the same thing for their ethnic group or for their, their, their national, um, for, their, for their ethnic group or their religion. Um, the mission of BDS is nothing more than realizing the principles of Israel's Declaration of Independence, which have remained unrealized since 1948. It calls for Israel to be a state of all its citizens, it calls for equal economic, political, civil, and religious rights for Jews and non-Jews. And this is far from the death knell for Israel that's claimed by opponents. It's a call for a democratic Israel, which doesn't designate one religion or ethnic group as superior to another. Though many who support BDS may support a one-state solution that would bring um, Israeli Jews and Palestinians of the West Bank and, and Gaza and Israel into a single state. The elegance, in my opinion, of BDS is that it doesn't make any explicit claims about that. It says that's an issue for later. Let's just deal with these three important basic principles and let's get Israel to do those. Israel will be forced to change fundamentally as a result of doing those three issues, three principles, and then we can get to the other issues of what Israel should be, whether it should be one state, or two state, whatever. Um, this strategy, what to me is elegant about the strategy as, a, as an American Jew, is that there are some Jews in Israel and in the United States who I don't have a lot in common with. They're called liberal Zionists. Um, and I, I disagree with a lot of what they stand for. By the way, I used to be a liberal Zionist 10 or 15 years ago when I first started writing my blog and have changed gradually as circumstances have called for. Um, but there are liberal Zionists who support two states. There's someone named Larry Durfner who writes for the Jewish Forward and he writes for the Los Angeles Jewish Journal. Um, and I disagree with Larry on a lot of things, but Larry supports BDS. And I want people like Larry who support a two-state solution, even if I don't necessarily believe that two states is, is a possibility anymore. I might have at one time, but I don't see it anymore. But I want someone like that to be able to feel that he can say he supports BDS. This is what happened in South Africa because apartheid, uh, the, the opposition to apartheid and the sanctions movement started out controversial. It started out with, you know, uh, um, the, uh, South African uh, blacks and, and their allies um, advocating for this, and then gradually it became a steamroller and took in ev virtually everyone who had a moral conscience. And that's what I think, you know, where BDS uh, is going to go. BDS is not Israel's enemy. In fact, both Jews and Israelis have endorsed it. You've heard of Neve Gordon, who's a professor at bar -Lan University. He wrote one of the first important Israeli statements of support for BDS. Uh, for which he, the president of his, his university said, 
damn, I wish there was some way I could fire this guy. But he had tenure, so they couldn't. They tried, but they couldn't. Um, and others have. And I'm going to read to you something very important that was written by an Israeli liberal Zionist. His name is Ron Adelist, and it was published in this month's issue of a magazine in Israel which I had never heard of, which has an odd name, Liberal. Um, I had thought that liberals were dead in Israel, apparently not. Um, there's a Russian oligarch who's providing money for the, for, the, uh, for the publication, so I guess you can exist as long as you have that kind of support. But anyway, he wrote a, a, a piece that's uh, it's an ironic take on the Israeli national anthem, which is called Hatikva, which means the hope. So the title of his piece is Hope is Not Yet Lost for International Pressure. And here's the money paragraph. It's clear, oh, by the way, he was a co-founder of Peace Now, which is a prototypical Israeli uh, liberal Zionist kind of movement. It's clear that peace cannot take hold here either with this nation or this current government. It's also clear that if something drastic doesn't happen, we are on the road to slaughter. Now, the next sentence I'm going to read, I fundamentally disagree with. But before you get upset, just listen to the whole passage, because I'll talk about both. Uh, we, uh, we're on the road to slaughter, on the way to the slaughterhouse called a binational state. But still, the skeptical Israeli public rocks in its chair gently and leisurely living life in a bubble. Luckily, we have the world. Slowly but surely, the world understands that it must draw out the splinter which interferes with too many people and interests. Slowly but surely, more than a few Israelis understand that without international pressure, we will fly off the 50th floor towards the pavement below, an accident waiting to happen. This pressure isn't meant to destroy Israel's economy or security, but to clarify to those who are hopping a ride on the messianic nationalist horse that this horse is dead. If we survey from a bird's eye view the organization of the pressure campaign against Israel, there's much that is hopeful. Now, I'm not sure if he's being ironic here or not, but even if he is, it's fine. Um, there's much that is hopeful. Economic sanctions, cancellation of artistic performances, academic boycott, arms embargo, prohibition of buying products marked, quote, made in Yehuda and Shomron, unquote. All this, by the way, is happening right now. And if nothing changes, we will jump up step by step till we reach the roof from which we will plummet to the ground. Now, I said that there is wisdom in this passage, but there's also liberal Zionism. So the idea that a binational state is going to lead to slaughter is a prototypical kind of uh, approach for American Jews and Israelis who don't want to face certain issues. They don't want to lose a Jewish state that provides superior rights for Jews. It's too comfortable. So instead of dealing with the issue and trying to figure out how they can get someplace and compromise with the other side and still have a, a, a resolution that it's going to be reasonably comfortable for both sides. They say, no, if you do this, it's going to be a holocaust. We're going to have the holocaust all over again. So it raises kind of like these, these um, red flags, um, if both for Jews, using terms like the Holocaust, and for the rest of the world, because the rest of the world is going to feel guilty if they hear Jews saying, you're going to, if you do, if BDS works, then there's going to be a Holocaust. So it's a good tool, a good argument uh, that resonates in certain people's uh, mind. Um, but so if there is a one state solution, what is true is that there will be enormous tension and conflict in Israel. How is Israel, as a state, going to realize these three principles and whatever else comes after? You're going to have to give up a lot of rights. Not, not, I wouldn't say you're going to have to give up. You're going to have to reinterpret your rights so that you share your rights. It doesn't mean, I mean, if, if Jews aren't going to have superior rights, it doesn't mean that Jews have to become slaves. It doesn't mean they have to live like if Palestinians live now in the occupation. It means they have to come to some kind of modus vivendi with the other people that live in Israel and in uh, the West Bank. Um, and, Gaza. and Gaza, right. It doesn't mean that Israel will become Rwanda or Bosnia or whatever you know, genocidal uh, situation you want to evoke. Palestinians and Israelis, when faced with the inevitable, will understand that they must live together or die. Both are a practical people and will choose life, I believe, as the Bible exhorts. 
What is astonishing about Adolus' article is that he recognizes that Israel itself is incapable of doing the right thing. He's begging the world to, quote unquote, stop us before we kill again. He's saying to the world, don't worry about the impact of BDS on our country. We know you're not trying to destroy us. We understand that your intent is instead to destroy the political power of the messianic nationalists currently ruling us. Go right ahead. There is in this perspective a sad fatalism. The fatalism of the liberal left in Israel, which realizes that it's come to the end of its road. It no longer wields any meaningful power in Israel. There's no labor party anymore. Labor party used to be socialist Zionism, the kibbutzim, the, you know, the elite of Israel, um, the, the flower of Israeli youth, the kibbutzim used to lead the IDF. It was all based on you know, idealism and socialism, whatever. It's gone, it's all gone. Um, for any sane outcome, he's saying the world must come to our rescue. The admis his admission though, although it's pathetic, is a tonic because it allows us to realize that if the world doesn't intervene, Israel will die. A list is inviting us to stop Israel before it's too late. As Israel's government grows increasingly extreme, those of us who care deeply about what will happen resonate with the wor words of the Canadian Jewish novelist Ayelet Waldman, who was born in Israel and married to the noted writer Michael Chabon. She was interviewed by Israel's Haaretz, and sh they asked her, um, if she thought the country could serve, still serve as a refuge for diaspora Jews facing anti-Semitism. It's one of those sort of basic, um, Israel is a Jewish homeland, a refuge for Jews from the Holocaust, etc. This is her response, very instructive. Quote, it could be if you don't ruin everything. If something is left once Netanyahu and his friends are done. The road is getting more and more national. The, the road is getting more and more nationalist, and I don't see any way that the end will be anything but a disaster." Unquote. Desperate times call for desperate measures. While some come to BDS enthusiastically, others come reluctantly after all previous attempts at reason ended in failure. Since nothing else has worked, a dose of stronger medicine is needed to bring Israel to its senses. Thanks. So I'm just going to say three short things before I start uh, the formal talk. Um, one is how did I get involved in this? Um, I've always been interested in this issue, but I didn't really become an activist in it until about um, last spring. And I was part of the first academic organization to vote for the um, boycott, academic boycott of Israel, which was a very small academic organization, I'm, I'm positive you haven't heard of, except for maybe in this context, which was the Association for Asian American Studies. Uh, and we voted uh, unanimously for the boycott. And the, uh, thank you, you're welcome. Uh, and uh, this um, journal called Inside Higher Education published a, a scathing uh, critique or criticism. Critique is too elevated a word for what they said. And among other things, they said, well, what, what do Asian Americans know about the Middle East? Um, and as I, uh, well, I replied to him, and then I blogged on this in truth out, and I said, well, if you think of an academic organization that studies Asian America, you might think that we would know something about the annexation of the sovereign state of Hawaii and the suppression of the indigenous peoples there. You'd think that we might know something about the internment of the Japanese Americans. And you might think that we would know something about the attacks on South Asian Muslims after 9-11. And you might think we would have learned something about the principle of solidarity, which means that even if your group isn't particularly directly affected, you understand that injustice and inequality is something that we should all be concerned about. And that's something I'll talk more about today. Thank you. Uh, secondly, um, I want to talk about the academic part of it in terms of academic freedom. After the ASA uh, vote, American Studies Association, which is a much larger association than Asian American Studies, after we voted for that resolution, uh, we were again attacked and uh, about 200 university presidents wrote letters 
decrying the vote, saying it was a horrible affront on academic freedom and that, you know, universities all are all about open uh, inquiry and collaboration and the free flow of ideas. Um, and that's pretty astounding because uh, nothing in the resolution prohibits that. And so I um, called my university president and I explained, I said, well, have you read the resolution? No. <laughs> uh, he's a smart guy. And so I explained, I read it to him. <laughs> and then he said, well, so it's really not all about academic freedom. I said, no. He said, so you're going to get slammed for being anti-Semitic? I said, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, the best analogy I can use is, is uh, as if Stanford, which we tried to do many times, um, did not renew its contract with Nike. Right? Just refused to buy any sports equipment, no swooshes on any of the uniforms, right? But individual faculty, students, staff could buy all the Nike products they wanted. That's what the academic boycott is about. It's a, it's a corporate decision on the part of the ASA or the AAAS or the Native American Indigenous Studies group to say we don't want to have our name associated with uh, Israeli universities. But the ASA invited Israeli scholars to our conference. We actually paid for them. We paid for Palestinian scholars to come too because we didn't want their funding to be tied to state, um, state control. So it in no way uh, prohibits us from having conferences, collaborating, co-authoring uh, studies with Israeli uh, professors. So that's another important point to get out. Third point I wanted to make is um, how this issue has really tapped into a strong emotional current. And this was brought to me uh, by my son, who was a Stanford undergraduate many years ago, but he used to come home and say, you know, we would talk about politics, and he said, well, you know, I can't talk about this with my friends. I mean, I can, I've re he had really, I mean, Jewish friends that he had had since middle school. And he would just mention the word Palestine, and they would just shun him. And that to me is not just a personal problem, it's an, a problem about education. Why is it that in our institutions of higher education where we're supposed to be precisely entertaining diversity of opinions, arguing with ideas, obtaining new knowledge that we didn't have before, and fighting prejudice that we can't talk about Israel-Palestine. And so that's really what got me more active in this than I ever thought before, simply as an educator. So now I'll just begin my presentation, which will be relatively short. Um, it's unavoidable, uh, unavoidable, perhaps, that discussions of Israel-Palestine have intense emotional content. But any project on university or college campuses that wishes to teach about peace and justice and to address the issue of Israel-Palestine needs to seriously address the question of emotions. It's too easy to imagine that emotions will simply evaporate once facts hit them. That doesn't happen. When I returned to campus from the American Studies Association conference in DC last year, as we members began deliberations on a much publicized resolution to support the call for academic boycott of Israel, I anticipated that there might be some fallout because of my various boycott blogs and a quote from one of my statements that made it into the front page of the New York Times. I actually got the last word, which is probably cool. I said, it was quoted, people who truly believe in academic freedom would realize that protesting the blatant and systemic denial of academic freedoms to Palestinians, which is coupled with material deprivation of a staggering scale, far outweighs concerns we in the West might have about our rather privileged academic freedoms. I was expecting some reaction when I returned to campus, but nothing prepared me for a comment that a Jewish colleague of mine made to me when we happened to bump into each other. He put his hand on my shoulder in not an entirely amicable way and said, I know why I'm obsessed with Jews, but why are you? After a moment, I was you know, entertaining you know, with the Chinese or the Jews of the East kind of thing. I didn't think that would go over very well. Um, <laughs> After the moment it took to process that remark, I replied, I'm not obsessed with Jews, I'm concerned about Palestinians. 
Now, why are my effective investments and political actions open to such radically different interpretations? My friend's comments, comments seem to reinforce the issue I tried to get across in the New York Times when I suggested that our concern might be better placed with the Palestinians, an actual aggrieved group, and the specific, specific harms done to them by both the occupation and structures of domination that continue to be imposed upon them in Israel, instead of hypothetical harms that might be um, visited upon us by the boycott. Most important is to consider how radically divergent his description of my actions were from my own. He simply could not accept a non-Jew's interest in the Middle East, especially if it seemed to emerge from a sensibility and political position different from his. My friend's obsessions with Jews, well, I should, he is Jewish, I just don't want to make that clear, seemed a natural outcome of his ethnic identity. His, his obsession raised no questions. His interest could only be interpreted as being naturally interested in his people. On the other hand, my concern about Palestinians was recoded by my, via my friend's worldview as an inexplicable obsession with Jews. By that, I can only assume he meant that I seem to him to be inordinately interested in criticizing the behavior of the Jewish people, when in actuality I was and am involved in critiquing the policies of the State of Israel that do persistent and unjust harm to Palestinians. It's precisely that fluid slide into misinterpretation that makes working on peace and justice in Israel-Palestine tremendously hard. In fact, any work toward peace and justice must tackle the question of on whose behalf are we doing what we are doing? I'll come uh, back to this later on. Well, similar to the way my friend characterized what I thought was my concern with the situation in Palestine as an obsession with Jews, the public and private discourse around Israel-Palestine is saturated with heated, passionate language. For example, in the same New York Times piece, there was a quote from Manuel Trachtenberg, a leading Israeli scholar, with regard to the ASA vote. And this reminds me of the painful rift that, that you quoted. Uh, so Manuel Trachtenberg says, it's almost like a family betrayal. It's very grave and very saddening when this happens, particularly so in the United States. End quote. I interpret this last phrase to reference the fact that for decades and decades, not only has the U.S. been Israel's staunchest political ally and most financially generous supporter, it has also happened that criticism of Israel State policies has been for the longest time nearly non-existent on college campuses and in academic organizations such as the ASA. Clearly, the latter situation is changing, and in Trachtenberg's eyes and many others, it's grave and saddening. I'm not in any way denying the legitimacy of these sentiments. In fact, part of me is deeply sympathetic. I cannot honestly say that I would not feel exactly the same way had I been brought up in similar circumstances and with those cultural and historical memories deeply ingrained in my life and those of my relatives. But while we cannot and should not disregard the past, we can and should take responsibility for knowing it as fully as possible and for not automatically discounting other narratives and other facts, even for reasons that seem indisputably right to us because we feel them so deeply. To study and to work for peace and justice requires a full set of information and knowledge about the cases that one is working on. The fact that the various interpretations of events do not necessarily jibe, many times they do not. The fundamental principle of educational institutions is that people are entrusted to form their judgments based on their interpretation of facts, and critically, people are responsible for testing out those interpretations in conversation and debate with others. It's here that abstract words like peace and justice come alive and are reshaped and adapted to the cases at hand. Until then, and this is the pragmatic position, there can only be a provisional and contingent consensus of what these words might actually mean. Most important, perhaps, is when human beings act on the basis of those words that we see what the real world effects and consequences our interpretations have. It's in colleges and universities that we're supposed to be exposed to and have a wide access to uh, views and opinions, but this is sadly not the case when it comes to one of the most important and urgent issues of the 20th and 21st century. I would wager that at every college and institution of higher education in the U.S., talking about the subject of Israel-Palestine is fraught. 
This, of course, opens up a huge contradiction succinctly found in this fact that Lawrence Summers, in the same breath, can condemn BDS or indeed every protest against Israel as anti-Semitic and also insist that college campuses should resound in energetic debate. And um, just two uh, examples that I'll, I'll close with. One is this um, group called AMCHA, which is, um, as they describe it on their website, a nonprofit organization dedicated to investigating, documenting, educating about, and combating anti-Semitism at institutions of higher education in America. On the surface, well, sounds pretty neutral, but there are 10 forms of anti-Semitic activity to the list, and I'll, I'll just list the four that are most troubling to me. What's anti-Semitic? Demonizing Israel, delegitimizing Israel, holding Israel to a double standard, promoting boycott, divestment, sanctions against Israel. Now, these are sp of specific concern to free speech on campus because even discussing any of these things, it's not just advocating for them, but discussing these things can be construed as being anti-Semitic, <laughs> simply raising the issue. Um, and um, I wrote one letter of protest to a college president who was, um, uh, well, not who, he wasn't, or she wasn't, but a, uh, this AMCHA group was targeting one of our colleagues. And um, in their letter, this is the Amtral letter to the, to the president of the university, it says, quote, most alarmingly, at the end of the event, she announced to the audience that she was working toward organizing collaborative agreements between CSU campuses and two Palestinian universities, and she urged students in the audience to let her know if they would be interested in studying at those universities. That's the high point. Um, so, this is troubling because obviously, no, I mean, well, not obviously, but individual faculty members can't just create these uh, uh, affiliations. They have to go through a long bureaucratic uh, process to do so. But what the point I'm trying to get at is simply by introducing the possibility that some students might want to study at these universities was cause for this person to be investigated. The other thing I want to talk about is Title VI uh, and the use of Title VI cynically uh, as a way to silence debate. Title, uh, Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act um, was used in the 1960s to desegregate public schools in the South. It prohibits discrimination based on race, color, or national origin, but does not include religion. But in October 2010, U.S. Secretary of Education Arne Duncan reaffirmed a set of guidelines initially promulgated in 2004. And, quote, this applies Title VI to the protection of Jewish students from anti-Semitism on campus. Under the Department of Education guidelines, the Civil Rights Act can be evo invoked if anti-Jewish behavior is considered to be based on shared ethnic characteristics. To be clear, it was not just Jewish students who were now to be protected under Title VI. On its face, the new protocol said a, that a group with a common religion would not be denied protection if they also shared actual or perceived ethnic characteristics or ancestral ties, and the examples that were given were Sikh Americans, Arab Muslims, Jewish Americans. However, various groups have attempted to interpret this new feature of the act by saying that anything that might cause emotional distress, and this gets back to the emotional issue, emotional distress to Jewish students must be curtailed and punished, and the vast majority of these campuses, uh, cases had to do with college protests. After those guidelines were put in place, several complaints were filed with the U.S. Department of Education, asserting things, uh, that things like Israel Apartheid Week and divestment protests were anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic. Those filing the complaints argued that such events created a threatening campus climate for Jewish students and were emotionally damaging. For example, at UC Santa Cruz, Tammy Rossman Benjamin filed a complaint arguing that, quote, as a result of their experiences in such university-sponsored anti-Semitic expression, Jewish students at my university have expressed feeling emotionally and intellectually harassed and intimidated by their professors, isolated from their fellow students, and unfairly treated by administrators. Some have even reported leaving the university, dropping classes, changing fields of study, and hiding symbols of their Jewishness, end quote. Despite this and several other attempts to deploy the new guidelines 
As noted in an article published in March 2012 in the um, Jewish Daily Forward, quote, a year and a half after the, after the federal government extended a landmark civil rights law to cover Jewish students, Jewish groups have yet to succeed in using this law against what they see as anti-Semitic, anti-Israel activity on campus. A survey by the Ford found that at least 10 anti-Semitism cases have been filed with either the Department of Education or in court under Title VI of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. In only one of these cases so far uh, has the complainant been favored, and this was a high school case in which Israel played no role. The determination letter written to UC Berkeley by the Department of Education contains the most succinct statement possible. It found that the kinds of protest events that were based, the basis of complaint, quote, constitute expression on, on matters of public concern directed to the university community. In the university environment, exposure to such robust and discordant expressions, even when personally offensive and hurtful, is a circumstance that a reasonable student in higher education may experience, end quote. I focus on this case because it, perhaps more than anything else, highlights what is unique about efforts to find peace and justice in Israel-Palestine. Coupled with what has been up to now our government's immense reluctance to criticize Israel and the long tradition of accepting an historical narrative with regard to Israel-Palestine that favors and legitimizes Israel while denying even, denying even the existence of Palestine, this use of the Civil Rights Act to silence debate about Israel in the name of protecting the sensibilities of certain students is remarkable and alarming. The title of my talk is meant, uh, was about peace and justice in Israel-Palestine, um, was meant as a rejoinder to my friend who posed to me the question, I know why I'm obsessed with Jews, but why are you? To really work for peace and justice, we have to see both as under the stewardship of all of us. And that justice are the entitlement, and peace and justice are entitlements of all, not just Jews, Palestinians, but of all people. And certainly it's not restricted to people that we are obsessed with or just care deeply about. We should each be given the right and indeed obligation to care about everyone. And caring about peace and justice means as well that we need to take care of peace and justice. And taking care of peace and justice decidedly does not mean to maintain a false sense of peace by quieting debate. That is hardly just. The DOE's finding was just right. One comes to university not to reinforce already existing beliefs. Why would you spend thousands and thousands of dollars to do that? Nor simply to gain knowledge and skills. One comes to institutions of higher education to be challenged in all sorts of ways. The much heralded ver value of diversity is not meant to be merely cosmetic. It's meant to bring diverse experiences and perspectives into the conversation. To actually understand and use that diversity, different views and perspectives must be given a fair and impartial hearing. One can certainly disagree, debate, raise questions, and, if one, could sh and one should, but that cannot take place in an environment when only some people are entitled to care and to care only about certain matters and, style, and in certain styles. Peace and justice should be seen as indivisible, not the right or privilege of only those we immediately are, uh, uh, care about. To really study peace and justice and to work for it requires an openness and an inquisitive energy that transcends our immediate perceptions and emotions. And we should not only be able to care for others, not like ourselves, we ought to. Thank you.